What's going on guys, I'm Noam Player here and today we're back with yet another Forsaken video and another roundup of a bunch of different topics. I'm going to be breaking down exactly what did happen to the Queen when she supposedly was killed by Oryx, where she went, where she's now and also how it ties into a quest line we're going to be doing soon inside the Dreaming City. There's actually a massive secret puzzle that has just been solved and it allows you to skip entire raid encounters, you heard that correctly, also earn extra loot and activate easter eggs. So I'm going to explain what this means and how you do it. And on top of that, Bungie have been updating the game in a few different ways, so I want to summarise all those changes as well as even more updates events and content drops we're getting in a few weeks from now so as always if you do enjoy these videos and want to support the channel you can do so by hitting the like button down below without further ado let's get into it so let's talk about the queen the shattered throne toland oryx and a bunch of storylines that actually do mean quite a lot in regards to the dreaming city as you've probably noticed and as we knew beforehand the city is in different phases of corruption so that is leading to a place and at the end of it there's supposed to be something big happening so there is a new location called the shattered throne and at some point we're going to be going there and doing a bunch of different quest steps and also possibly meeting Marasov herself. This also ties into Marasov being inside her throne world which is inside the Ascendant Realm and to explain this I need to give a bit of context into what's going on here. So in a bunch of Lord tabs inside Forsaken we did actually learn what the Queen's plan is and what she's doing and where she is right now and also stems back of course that massive cutscene against Oryx Taken King. It's been three years since this cutscene came out and we watched Marasov supposedly die but of course at the time we had no idea what was going on and until pretty much now we still didn't really know what the scene was about. But thanks to the new law in this DLC, we now know exactly what this plan was and what this entire thing was about. So essentially, to put it very simply, Marasov deliberately got herself killed by Oryx to then go into her throne world. Then after that, knowing the Guardians would kill Oryx so she can then claim all of Oryx's power. Obviously, it is a bit more complicated than that. There's a lot more Awoken magic and Tekken stuff to even get her there in the first place. But that essentially is the plan. So in this scene, the Tekkens who are behind her could have actually saved her and they were prepared to do so. But Mara tells her not to save her and specifically to let her die and that is what happens you can see in this grimar card it says the shockwave strikes mara dies so there you go she was officially dead but because of the way that oryx's hive magic works and also the harbingers and tekkens what they did as well instead of just dying straight up she actually went into oryx's ascendant realm so basically think of it as like an afterlife where she is trapped forever the next step in her plan involves eris morn and this would be for her to train the guardians and get us to kill oryx in the raid which we did and now the queen is basically going to take oryx's power this one segment from the grimar card sums it up perfectly so it says the queen has enlisted Eris and several million mad dancing guardians to go knock off the god who killed her is on that level a very simple bank heist. Get yourself taken into the treasury as treasure and then when the owner dies break out with his stuff. So now all these very confusing cutscenes make a ton of sense especially Eris Morn being told by the queen it's all up to you now you have to guide the guardians to kill Oryx this is why. So this whole time the queen has been inside the ascendant realm which is the same place that we go to anytime we step into a portal and go to the very dark kind of black and white place. The ascendant realm is where all the hive gods live and where their throne worlds are so Crota's throne world, Oryx is one, even Savathun is in there somewhere as well. Even the Mindbender managed to get his own throne world that's why his boss fight is inside here but by him studying the hive magic and learning it and also killing a guardian as powerful as Cade he managed to get his own one as well. Totem the Shafted is also inside here as well of course he talks to us when we do the ascendant challenges and during the campaign he's been in here for a very long time since the Crota raid that failed but funnily enough Tolan did the exact same thing the queen did so he deliberately got himself killed by a the death singer so that he could go into the ascendant realm this is where he's been the whole time but another way this whole hive magic thing works is that once Oryx dies someone can claim his power and take it for them Themselves. So that's what the Queen and Tolan both seem to be doing. The Queen has been having conversations with Tolan inside this Ascendant Realm, so of course they're both there together, but they might not exactly be on the same side. So going back to the Shattered Throne, you can see this is a quest step coming up soon at some point, and it says strike back at the curse that plagues the Dreaming City. It also appears to be some kind of new activity called a dungeon, so it says complete the dungeon, the Shattered Throne, while wearing a full set of Reverie Dawn while Ascendant. There's also another step that says defeat Vorgith, the Boundless Hunger in the dungeon, the Shattered Throne while Ascendant. So I actually think that this Shattered throne they're talking about is going to be Oryx's at Shattered Throne because as we know it's been destroyed and that is where Marasov is right now. There's another Grimmar card talking about the moment that Oryx died and we killed him and it says his death caused an aftershock that reaches throne world where Marasov was standing and it says it crumbles around her like stone, like ash, like veils in a breeze. It says Eris Morn's friends have succeeded, the guardians have slain a god and she's walking through his destroyed throne world. Her great and terrible gamble has paid off, the rest is up to her now. Something else I notice is that of course Tolan's full name, his title, is Tolan and the Shattered so that could be a correlation to the Shattered Throne because of course he is in there right now. So that is basically a bit of backstory and everything that I could find about this place called the Shattered Throne and of course how it ties into the Queen and Oryx and this quest step. Lots of very interesting stuff and you definitely have to appreciate the Bungie story team for planning this out 
three years ago, those very confusing cutscenes that at the time, of course, made no sense but now come together. But of course, comment down below your theories and speculations. What do you guys think of this stuff? So let's talk about the Wall of Wishes. This is honestly one of the craziest things in this DLC. It is a very, very cool feature mechanic. This is a massive kind of secondary secret to the Last Wish raid, very similar to the underbelly of Leviathan, but this has a lot of features. So essentially, at the very beginning of the raid, instead of going to Kali, you can veer off to the left and go to a special little cave, and inside there is going to be a massive wall with a bunch of symbols. This wall is the Wall of Wishes and basically think of it as a cheat code combination where you can type in a bunch of different stuff and combinations of symbols to get a bunch of different outcomes. So as you've probably seen, these cheat codes are actually hidden all around the DLC. So these plates basically with the cheat code symbol combinations are inside the raid a lot of them and some even on Nessus and some inside this cutscene of the Dreaming City. The order of the symbols inside these plates which are scattered everywhere are the same ones you punch into this giant Wall of Wishes and these are going to give you different outcomes. There are 15 different wishes or cheat codes and so far about seven of them have been discovered so these are seven different combinations we know of thankfully someone called tiredness made a really cool infographic basically showcasing all of these wishes these symbols what they're called and also of course what they give you as the actual outcome so in terms of entering these codes you go up to the wall and shoot each panel and make it change the different symbol of course there are 12 in total so four different dragons four different birds four different snakes and also four different fish but every time you shoot one it's going to cycle through the icons and you basically change it to be the actual combination you want it to be of course once once you've assembled all the correct symbols onto the wall, you simply step into this middle plate and that is going to activate it, whatever you've done. So wish number two that I'm entering in right here, you can see this is actually to spawn a chest between the third and fourth encounter and that's literally going to give you bonus loot, simple as that. Wish number three is pretty interesting and this gives you a new emblem, so it's called the Numbers of Power and it's going to simply drop for you right there and then. Wish number four, five and six is where things get crazy though, so these let you literally skip entire raid encounters to anywhere in the raid you want. So wish number four, for example, is going to skip you past Kali to Shiro Chi, the second Tekken. Or you can do wish number five, and that is going to skip you all the way to Morgith, the giant ogre. Wish number six is going to let you skip all the way to the vault encounter right before Riven. So if you want to, as you can see right here, I have no checkpoints, and now I'm at the vault just after doing this checkpoint. We don't yet know if wish number seven lets you skip to Riven. I'm assuming it does, but it may not at the same time. Who knows? But wish number eight is where things get pretty interesting. This is where the Easter eggs come into it. Activating this wish is going to play the Hope for the Future song, which is a bit of a meme, the Paul McCartney one that played in Destiny 1. It's literally going to play that song in the entire raid. Wish number 11 is going to activate probably one of the most famous Easter eggs in Bungie history. This is the Grunt birthday party effect. If you don't know, this Easter egg stems all the way back to when Bungie made Halo a long time before Destiny, and this of course meant when you kill grunts, they'd burst into confetti and make weird noises. So that is a serious Bungie throwback, and it's going to make a lot of Halo players very nostalgic. So like I said, these are about half the wishes so far, still a bunch more to be found. Now is the hunt to find the rest of these plates and see what the rest of these Easter eggs and cool features are going to be. Of course, like I said, some of them are hidden in very strange places, some inside the raid, some inside Nessus, and some inside this cutscene on the Titan Shield. So I'll put a link down below in the description to a bunch of people compiling these plates and of course the infographic as well. And of course, when more stuff is found, I will let you guys know. So stay tuned right here on the channel. So next up, talking about Bungie's latest update to the game and what's changed, what's new, what they've done with it. Probably the best thing is that the offering to the Oracle now goes to the Postmaster if the player's consumables is full. So of course, the bug, which I'm sure a ton of us, myself included, lost out on an offering for, has now been fixed. I'm pretty sure there is still some sort of bug where it might disappear if you do some sort of activities or fast travel with the offering in your inventory so just to be safe always go to the oracle itself to turn it in but at least the main way that most of us lost it has been fixed so it will go to the postmaster now. On top of that we got an update to the RS Pulsator Ghost Shell the exotic which we've been talking about for like two months now. Bungie acknowledged it for the very first time ever and they said they removed it from the Ghost Shell collections as it's not currently available. Of course it was added in Warmind but it was never actually available no one really got it then they put it in the collection kiosk with Forsaken and said it was supposed to drop from the Spire of Stars raid and now they removed it because it is not currently obtainable so I'm assuming at some point in the future they're going to officially make it obtainable inside the game and of course when they do I'll let you guys know because I know a ton of you guys want to get the shell really badly. The daily clan bounties are now going to rotate daily instead of weekly like they used to and they also fixed the bug with the traveler's chosen sidearm not being able to be dismantled or transferred to the vault which is pretty funny. They've actually disabled the ability to rejoin Gambit games and enabled the ability to rejoin games you've left in competitive so kind of weird situation but that's what they've done. So looking beyond that we do still have quite a lot of updates and content drops and events happening in the coming weeks. So next Tuesday we're actually getting a lot of Crucible stuff. We're getting four new maps and also a new mode called Breakthrough. This mode is going to be 4v4 in the competitive playlist and a sort of like a two-stage hardpoint or King of the Hill mode. Essentially both teams are going to try and capture a zone in the enemy spawn. The first team to do so is going to go in the offensive and then have to capture a vault and the other team is going to have to defend that vault in the time limit. On Tuesday we're also getting four brand new Crucible 
special maps which are going to feature Breakthrough and of course all the other classic modes. But the first one is called Gambler's Ruin in the Tangle Shore. You can see the icon right here. We're also getting the Citadel, which is set on the Dreaming City, a very cool location, and Firebase Echo, which is a Cabal installation on Nessus. This was in the Sandbox stream. Definitely the most interesting map is called Equinox, and this, as you can see, is also set inside the Unknown Space, the same as Eternity, the very mysterious Trials of the Nine map. And of course, all throughout then, we're still going to be getting the weekly playlist update, evolution of the Dreaming City, and additional surprises. So I'm assuming that means the Black Spindle type quest lines they're waiting for us. There's definitely classified exotics that time gate, and at some point in October and November, Bungie is just going to turn them on and activate them. And then we're also not that far away from the first DLC of Forsaken, the Black Armory, and that's going to accompany the dawning event. So with that, we are getting the return finally of machine guns or LMGs in the heavy slot, and also, of course, the Black Armory, forges of chain activity, a raid layer, exotics, legendaries, and stuff like that. So lots of stuff to do right now in the game, and even more on the way in the future. So a pretty good time for Destiny 2. But that is going to wrap up this video, of course, if you enjoyed it. And if you want to support my channel, then leaving a like rating before you go is much appreciated. Like I said, we've got lots of stuff on the way, so make sure you're not missing out on my videos by subscribing and turning notifications on by hitting the bell icon next to it. You can follow my Instagram and Twitter pages down below in the description and click this image to watch another video from me. But as always, I appreciate you guys and I'll see you all in the next one.